Hi everyone, this chapter is Child Abuse and Neglect and Family Violence. This is sort of a hard chapter to talk about. It's pretty sad um, content, really, um, talking about uh, child abuse especially. Um, but it's really necessary for us to um, have at least some basic understanding of signs and then how to tell maybe things that might look like signs of abuse but um, are not. So, and then kind of what our role is and um, what's what's appropriate for us as healthcare providers. Um, so this is chapter 58 in um, the fifth edition, and these are um, the objectives. Kind of lengthy and wordy, so I won't read them. You guys can read those through. So, um, talking about abuse and neglect, um, maltreatment is defined as abuse and neglect of victims. The U.S. laws differ regarding reporting adult victims of intimate partner violence, older adult abuse, and neglect and labor and sex trafficked individuals. Um, abuse is a public health problem that can be physical, sexual, uh, emotional, and verbal, or a combination of any of these. And victimizing social issues that include children, um, child maltreatment, spousal or intimate partner violence, elder abuse, human trafficking. And then neglect refers to the act of or the omission by parents or caretakers, um, basically a failure to provide adequate care, to failure to um, provide adequate support, nutrition, health care, surgical care. And then um, PANDA, which stands for Prevent Abuse and Neglect Through Dental Awareness, is an educational and awareness program created to promote prevention of abuse and neglect through early identification and intervention. So you can see of maltreatment, neglect is the highest um, percentage. And the next, physical abuse, sexual abuse, and then other. So early recognition of child abuse as a medical and public health problem arose from proactive health care providers who typically only described the physical aspects of the maltreatment up into the early 1970s. Um, CAPTA broadly, um, which is Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, so CAPTA broadly defines child abuse and neglect as any recent act or failure to act on the part of a parent or caregiver um, that results in the death, serious physical or emotional harm, sexual abuse, or exploitation, or an act or failure to act that um, presents an imminent risk of serious harm. So they don't have to be inflicting the harm. They could fail to protect their child from it. It is estimated that more than one-third of all U.S. children are subjects of investigated child maltreatment reports, and more than one-half of African-American children are the subjects of such investigation. So in 2015, an estimated 1,670 children died from abuse and neglect in the United States. It's just kind of heartbreaking when you think about it. Of those fatalities, three quarters were younger than three. It just, that's kind of gut-wrenching. And boys had a higher child fatality rate than girls. So um, table 58.1 and 58.2 in the textbook are really good resources. I think I actually put 58.1 in the next slide. Um, so we'll look at that in a second. Children with special needs have a higher victimization risk for maltreatment than children not reported to have special needs. Um, so this just really ties in perfectly to our um, course and what we are focusing on. So here is, this is table 58.1, I believe. 
So it um, categorizes neglect, physical abuse, sexual abuse, and emotional abuse, and then some of the descriptors, so some of the things um, that are included under those categories. And then the other table is much lengthier, so that was harder to add as a slide. But um, if you have the fifth edition, um, look at that or um, maybe ask a classmate um, if you can take a look at it if they don't, if you don't have the fifth edition. It won't be on a test though, but it's good information. Uh, types of abuse. So um, just so that table that I just showed, we'll kind of go through that a little bit. So there's neglect, which is basically um, like depriving of food, water, clothing, shelter, supervision, or medical care. So it's kind of a lack of caring for um, to the to the detriment or the harm of your child. Physical abuse, non-accidental injury or threatened injury. Sexual abuse, use of sex to hurt, degrade, dominate, humiliate, gain power over a victim. Emotional and or um, psychological abuse. Intimidation with gestures, yelling, smashing. Um, destroying the victim's property, threats to threat to harm a child or children to keep them from the victim, isolating a victim from friends and family. It's all um, under the category of emotional or psychological abuse. So with physical abuse, physical abuse is the use of physical force such as hitting, kicking, punching, I mean just about any kind of horrible thing you can think of. Um, even poisoning or burning, other physical acts of harm that have the potential to harm or injure a child. Um, abusive um, head trauma is the leading cause of serious or fatal brain injuries occurring in children under the age of two. And that was often um, sort of just kind of summed up as shaken baby, but it can be um, other forms of head trauma as well. But um, the brain being shook is also a major part of that with um, children under two. Other typical sites of inflicted injuries of abuse are the buttocks, uh, the lower back, the genitals and inner thighs, cheeks, ears, lips, um, labial frenum, the neck, arms, and hands. So children exhibiting fresh or healed bite marks is an elliptical in an elliptical or oval shape with indentation consistent with a human adult bite or the arch of a human adult um, and then the distance of the inner canine the the inner canine distance is also a factor that helps kind of determine whether or not you're looking at an adult bite or if you're looking at maybe like another child bite so if it's greater than three centimeters that that tends to point to an adult has bitten the child. Um, if it's accompanied without abrasion or um, contusion or laceration, it should ar um, arouse suspicion. So if all you see is a bite and there's nothing else, um, it, it should, but I feel like a bite period would be kind of suspicious, but um, it should it should arouse suspicion of an adult human bite rather than one inflicted by an animal or another child. So sexual abuse, um, most victims and perpetrators know each other. Um, immediate reactions from like family members and um, or immediate reaction from the victim could be shock, disbelief, or fear. Um, that it's that it's taken place. Um, oral indicators of sexual abuse. So this is um, one that we should be keenly aware of what this would look like and what would be um, particularly inappropriate at an age for these um, signs and symptoms. So venereal warts um, in anybody really under the age of 18 particularly, but especially and you know under the age of like 16 perhaps but um, that should you know definitely raise a red flag syphilis emerging as ulceration um, canker sores or mucus patch gonorrhea may appear as pharyngitis tonsillitis or gingivitis so that one would be harder to detect I would think and then herpes can manifest as that gingivostomatitis that can be um, just very painful red red 
um, tissue ulcerations and um, and then there may be some lesions out on the outer lip so that one might be a little bit more um, obvious oops sorry bouncing all over the place so um, let me look through the notes if there was anything else I wanted to say Long-term symptoms of sexual abuse include anxiety, fear, post-traumatic stress, in some cases, um, arrested development, um, so, you know, they stop developing mentally. Human papillomavirus is recognized as yet another indic indicator of child sexual abuse associated with the formation of oral warts, so um, that's another wart-like um, STD. And then palatal petechiae should be a sign, um, could be a sign of forced oral sex. So um, down back on the soft palate, if there's a lot of like a bruising or a lot of petechiae back there, um, that would definitely be um, grounds for, for maybe some questions about what, what could be causing that. Um, when sexual abuse is suspected, all observations should be documented and a complete patient history is obtained from the parents or caregivers separately from the child. So it's kind of like trying to find out what happened and see if the stories match. This document, um, documentation allows for a determination of the child's safety and information to report immediately to um, CPS or Child Protective Services. So it's not so much our um, role to be the judge and jury by any means, but if we have a strong suspicion, it is definitely our job to let somebody know and then let them figure it out. And if just because you have a suspicion and it ends up being wrong, that's okay. Um, you are just acting on the safe for the safety of the child. And the agencies that are experts in that will determine um, whether something more needs to happen. So emotional maltreatment, um, pattern of behavior such as um, constant criticizing or belittling or not providing love or guidance to a child, these are forms of emotional maltreatment. Behavioral and emotional signs of maltreatment, um, they may be expressions of aggression, disruptive behavior, anger, rage, anxiety, or fear. That's a child who is um, presented with a lot of emotional abuse. Children who have key developmental processes di um, disrupted as a result of emotional maltreatment will experience mental well-being changes such as anxiety, low mood, aggression, deficits in social skills, and poor interrelationships, and will suffer negative academic outcomes as well, so their grades um, can be affected. Neglect is something we'll probably see far more often and can be frustrating because it can, you know, sometimes it has to do with the barriers that the um, parents are facing, but a lot of times with kids, there's a lot of resources. So really, there isn't a lot of excuses. Kids can get oral health and medical. Um, older people, it's harder for sure, but kids really do have many, many, many resources. So neglect typically um, a failure by the parent, caregiver, guardian to provide just the basic physical, educational, emotional needs. Um, oral manifestations would be poor oral hygiene, untreated dental disease. Caregivers will um, willful failure to ensure continuity of care after being altered to children's um, oral health needs. So that sentence got a little confusing. But basically, after the caregiver has been told emphatically by the health care provider that their child has this problem and needs this treatment, and they refuse or fail to get that treatment, and the child gets sicker and sicker or has more pain or the infection gets bigger, and that is absolute neglect. If they have been told full well and given resources of how to help their child um, get back to a healthful state and they refuse to do it. So poor oral health literacy or a lack of access to oral health care um, may contribute to dental neglect. Um, sorry, hold on. Presenting um, a difficult situation for oral health professionals. Uh, so it's sometimes it's neglect because of, you know, maybe a distinctive choice, but other times maybe it's neglect because 
of just absolute mounting difficulty and, you know, trying to get the electrical bill or trying to survive an abusive relationship. And so dental and the dental needs of your child just are not dinging the priority bell, so to speak. So that is an incredibly hard situation. Um, and so, you know, we just have to try and figure out how to do everything to um, communicate the importance and to help parents, um, especially if we're in a public health field. Um, usually in a general practice, we don't see it as much as if we were in a uh, practice that um, was more public health or low income or maybe served more um, um, state insurance, uh, Medicaid and Medicare, that sort of thing. So indicators of maltreatment, um, general manifestations would be repeated injuries, multiple bruises in different areas of the body in different stages of healing. Um, inappropriate behavior or a neglected appearance could be some um, clues. May exhibit passive or withdrawn behavior, um, may have poor self-image, um, they might act out sexually, there's um, depression, anxiety at times, substance abuse, uh, eating disorders, hostility, lack of cooperation, self-abusive behavior, suicidal thoughts, social or academic problems, or um, a reluctance to return to um, awaiting adults. So if they feel, if they seem fearful to want to have to go back to someone who's um, brought them there, that would be a pretty clear sign as well. The goal of good parenting is enabling a child to grow up with feelings of satisfaction and security and self-respect. So that's, that's what parents would want for their kids. Nurturing caretakers would not hesitate to seek immediate medical or dental treatment for an injured child. So obviously, like, parents who love their kids, they'd never postpone, willfully postpone treatment if they, you know, if they thought their child was in pain or needed something. But uh, perpetrators or people who um, are inflicting abuse on others um, typically are far less forthcoming about the nature of um, injuries and more likely intentionally delay the treatment um, because they don't want it to be found out. They don't want um, the child to say something. So they would actually delay bringing um, the child in for a medical or dental attention. Oral and um, perioral manifestations. Lips are the most common site for injuries associated with child abuse. So that's really important for us to know. Oral mucosa, teeth, gingiva, and tongue, also common areas of abuse injury. Dental neglect manifests as poor oral hygiene, rampant dental caries, or failure to follow through with dental treatment. Signs of sexual abuse are often present in child's oral cavity, but difficult to identify. So oral pharyngeal trauma, palatal petechiae, or oral warts like we talked about earlier. So some common um, Oral manifestations of physical maltreatment might include um, something uh, like trauma to the tongue or the lips or the gingiva or a frenum, like a tear, um, fractured teeth, avulsed teeth, um, or non-vital teeth. Uh, oral indicators of sexual abuse, we talked about some of this, but, um, well, actually, I think we said all of these already. Yeah, so those are just the venereal warts and um, and the other things that went along with syphilis and gonorrhea. Um, so oral manifestations of neglect include poor oral hygiene. We already talked about that as well. These notes are very repetitive. So abuse versus findings um, mistaken for abuse. So when is something, when can we feel more confident that we're looking at abuse? And when 
could it be something else? And we just don't want to say the, we don't want to like accuse somebody or, you know, and, and say the wrong thing. So how do we know to feel confident in our gut instincts or our instincts? So healthcare workers must use their professional judgment. Um, accidental injuries normally heal at the same time. So if somebody kind of banged themselves up in one injury, everything would kind of be healing simultaneously. Whereas injuries from abuse are going to have, be in all these various stages. So that's kind of a clue. Greater the mobility of the child, the more likely accidental bruising can occur. So if they are younger than um, three or no, that's not right. If they're younger than a year. So if they have not started walking yet um, and there's bruises. So if they are still um, a baby baby, that is definitely not uh, normal. Um, so once they start toddling around, they t do tend to be kind of clumsy. Genetic conditions with manifestations that mimic signs of physical abuse. There's these syndromes here um, that are pretty rare, idiopathic, thrombocytopenic, um, purpura, um, and then EDS, and then um, Sturge-Weber syndrome. So those are fairly, but they can, and also some other bleeding um, disorders. But Sturge-Weber syndrome, it's a rare disorder that's present at birth. A child with this condition has a port wine stained birthmark, usually on the face, and the nervous and has nervous system problems. Um, EDS is a group of inherited connective tissue disorders marked by extremely loose joints, hyperplastic skin that bruises very easily, and damaged blood vessels. Um, symptoms of EDS includes fragile, stretchy skin, easy scarring, poor wound healing, and then idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura, um, that is a bleeding disorder in which the immune system destroys platelets, which are necessary for normal blood clotting. Um, HIV and hemophilia also um, have indicators that mimic physical abuse. Infectious skin conditions such as eczema, dermatitis, or empatigo may be, may, may be mistaken for abuse because that might be all these patches all over and some might look worse than others and some might look better, but they're actually a skin condition. Cultural practices such as cupping, coining, or scraping um, used in some families to alleviate illness may cause unintentional injuries to the child. So cupping is where you warm up the cup and then it suction cups to the body and it pulls and pulls and pulls and kind of makes a area that kind of looks like a bruise. And usually it's all over the back. Um, and then coining and scraping is like rubbing, um, rubbing the metal on the skin, usually on the back again, to alleviate like respiratory illnesses. So it's these cultural practices, but they can leave marks on the body. Um, so in our assessments, all patients are assessed for health history and physical, behavioral, and oral findings. Um, for instance, if you have a child that just seems, you know, really withdrawn, um, maybe fearful, but in a way that doesn't seem to line up with just a kid that doesn't want you to, you know, poke his gums or something like that. You'd make notes, perhaps, um, the first time that you saw them. Talk to them and try and see if there's like some kind of just regular discussion about the appointment and what's going to go on and how to make them feel more comfortable and see if that changes their behavior, but if it's something that seems different from that. Um, then you want to obviously keep this in your notes and assess. So collaboration with physicians, social workers, and other interdisciplinary health care providers may be needed to manage the physical, psychological, or social consequences of maltreated individuals. So it's definitely not, not something, this is definitely outside of our wheelhouse, but we are the ones that can spot something and get some help going. Um, patient education. Suspected cases of child maltreat maltreatment may warrant taking separate child and adult patient histories. So um, does the child and the adult's history match? Are their stories lining up? Is there consistency with injury, timeline, and explanation? Have other similar injuries occurred with the child um, and or other household members, so maybe other kids in that house. Determine whether to discuss your suspicions with the adult on the basis of the child's safety. Parents and caregivers should be approached separately, always in private, without the child or 
um, or others present. So in your documentation, include text, photographs, or other pertinent information. You can take pictures with an intraoral camera very, very, very easily and not arise suspicion. Um, and that's one of the wonderful tools that we have in our um, in our arsenal, so to speak. Um, record uh, record all clinical and behavioral findings. Document all conversations. Use full names. Use quotes for verbal statements. Record reasons for seeking treatment or delaying treatment. Um, if parents, you know, ask them straight out, um, why haven't you scheduled this um, this root canal? For your child, they have this abscess. It's an active infection. It's unhealthy. Why haven't you scheduled this? Um, what can we do to help you? Um, you know, showing empathy, but also, you know, not sugarcoating it and asking why this has happened, you know, why the treatment's being delayed. Obtain the usual consent document report made to, um, document your report made to the local CPS agency. So victims of child maltreatment are at risk of being victimized by um, intimate partner violence. 25% um, of maltreated children were exposed to caregivers with domestic violence risk, and abuse and neglect have far-reaching negative um, risks for health, well-being, and longevity um, of, its, of the traumatized victims. So long-range health psychologic and social implications in children have been attributed to um, intimate partner violence exposure, emotional and behavioral problems, including mood and anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress, you can only imagine, substance abuse, and school-related problems in children and adolescents also can result from exposure to intimate partner um, violence. So that would be like, you know, um, maybe mom has an abusive boyfriend or um, stepdad is abusive or the biological, you know, mother or father is abusive. And it certainly can go both ways. It doesn't just have to be a man who is um, the abuser. It could be a, a woman as well. Um, so let's see, bullying, use of force or um, coercion to abuse or intimidate others. Um, that is basic, that's um, essentially the definition of bullying. Prevalent um, public health problem, we've heard a lot about bullying. It continues in a variety of settings, in schools, on the internet, um, textings, and in the cell phone world, um, social media world, and the workplace. And then bullies and victims of bullying um, are more likely to be exposed to violence at home, which is um, sort of surprising, but maybe not so surprising, really. Um, intimate partner violence. So partner of abusive behavior used by a current or farmer um, oh, pattern, sorry, I was like, that doesn't make sense. Pattern of abusive behavior used by a current or far, former partner or spouse to gain or maintain power and control over the other intimate partner. So um, mental health consequences, for sure. Rates during pregnancy are alarmingly high. And then routinely ask about intimate partner violence, always in private, and then document the disclosure. And of course, away from the potential partner that might be inflicting the abuse. So both bullying and intimate partner violence involve an aggressor and an individual perceived to be less powerful or weaker. An estimated 71% of women and 58% of men were under age 25 when they first encountered sexual violence, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner. Mental health consequences include risk of depression, mood and anxiety disorders, PTSD, suicide, poor self-esteem and memory loss, chronic headaches and concussions resulting from battery to the head. And then reproductive coercion is a common aspect of intimate partner violence and includes the abusive partner controlling the reproductive or sexual health of the other person. So things like refusing to use birth control, destroying contraceptive measures, um, fear of um, condom let's see, fear of condom negotiation, coerced abortions or forced pregnancy continuation, um, 
or intentionally getting the partner pregnant. So all these, so either preventing, forcing an abortion, um, making it so that they do get pregnant when maybe they don't want to, all of these are forms of control. Intimate partner violence is rampant, yet not all states have mandatory requirements for reporting it. So we have to know our state and our the laws around mandatory reporting. So when we talk about older adults and their vulnerabilities um, towards abuse and neglect, um, any intentional or neglectful act by a caregiver or any other person that causes harm or serious risk of harm to a vulnerable adult. Um, so, you know, even though they're much, much older than children, they're at the other end of the spectrum, they're still very vulnerable oftentimes and dependent on people around them. So domestic older adult abuse, any form of maltreatment of an older person by someone who has a relationship with him or her, spouse, sibling, child, friend, caregiver, that occurs in the home. Then there's institutional abuse, occurs in residential facilities. Um, this can be staff, professionals, caregivers who are paid to care and protect for these, protect these residents. Then there's self-neglect, the harm of the potential harm created by one's own behavior. Occurs when vulnerable adults fail or refuse to address their own basic physical, emotional, or social needs. So older adult abuse is categorized as domestic abuse, institutional, or self-neglect. We talked about that. Um, I just want to see if there's anything else here. So often because of social isolation and limited mobility, visits to medical or dental professionals are the only contact the elderly or vulnerable adults have outside the home. So this places the burden of identifying maltreatment in the hands of a healthcare professional because they might be totally isolated. Nobody may go to their house and see them and check on them so nobody would ever know. Not all vulnerable adults are older. They could also be um, just somebody with... Um, a substantial mental or functional impairment that's of any age above the age of 18. So that's just the defining age, you know, child abuse versus um, an adult abusive situation. So human trafficking um, is um, something that I feel like we're hearing more about and I'm very I'm horrified and thankful that we are hearing more about it. Um, I, I know it's been um, something that's gone on for, for a very long time, but it seems that there are more activists and people um, that are really addressing this and saying this is a problem and it's becoming a really big problem in America and we need to address it and do something about it. Um, so it's a form of modern day slavery in which people profit from the control and the exploitation of others. Traffickers control victims using financial tactics, social restrictions, and legal insecurities. Um, the indicators of traffic victims may include a patient is brought to the office by someone and is not allowed to come alone. Patient may be shy. Another person is in charge of that person and kind of dictates their treatment, even though they are an adult. That would seem odd. Patient has no form of identification. Um, so maybe the other person just pays cash and says they don't, we don't have their driver's license. They don't have a driver's license or whatever it might be. Patient cannot speak or understand English. Traffic wants, a uh, trafficker wants the best dental work. Cost is no object. So they're very concerned with cosmetics, not so much health, but cosmetics and cost is not an object. Aesthetic is the reason for the vi um, visit, not the patient's health. Victim will move from office to office with no dental home. So they are not going to hang around very long. They'll go to a different dentist and get the, um, the cosmetic work that they want done for the for their the victim because they're a commodity to them essentially they want them to look nice on the outside they don't care really about their real true health or their mental health um, human trafficking is the fastest growing and second largest criminal industry in the world. Um, human trafficking is a form of modern day slavery, which we said in which people profit. We already said that victims of human trafficking include children, um, is, is a very large 
percentage of the group involved in sex trades, adults who are coerced or deceived into commercial sex acts, and anyone forced into different forms of labor of service. Many victims will encounter healthcare professionals who will not recognize these individuals as victims. All dental professionals are mandated to report maltreatment of a minor under the age of 18 and vulnerable adults regardless of consent. However, an adult trafficked person must consent to contacting authorities unless state laws for weapon involvements um, differ. But so that's very tricky. I mean, you could have a big time hunch that somebody in say in their 20s or something seems like they could be trafficked and and what do you do if they don't give consent? So these adults should be encouraged to self-report to the 24 um, hours, seven day a week. Um, Polaris Project's National Human Trafficking Hotline. Um, and the phone number is in the um, textbook. Or And then there's um, several other. I actually think I put it on the on the last slide. So you'll, there's the information there, especially for those of you who don't have this text. Um, so reporting abuse, dental hygienists and dentists are mandated reporters um, for child abuse and neglect. Um, and that's because we're in a perfect opportunity to, to identify certain types of um, abuse or things that just don't seem right and possibly make a difference. Duty is to report suspicions to appropriate authorities and document observations. That's our duty, to report our suspicion. We don't have to be right about it. We don't want to be like, jumping the gun and thinking everyone's an abused child, but we want to use our professional judgment and then report our suspicion because really if nothing's going on, it's not going to be a big deal. They're not going to, just because something's reported does not mean CPS is ripping kids out of families' homes at all. CPS and law enforcement have expertise and resources to investigate reports. Adult protective services are services provided to older um, people and those with disabilities. So instead of child protective services, there's APS, um, adult protective services. <clears throat> State established immunity laws protects reporters from civil law or criminal penalties resulting from filing a confidential report of suspected abuse. So there is a protection there um, for, for us as mandated reporters. So here's the slide with the, um, the numbers. You know, it's just, I suppose it's good to know where to get these numbers if you ever um, were in a situation where you wanted to give them to somebody or use them. Um, and that is, that is that for that section.